Good morning. My name is Roz Pellis. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Poor People's Campaign, a national, a national call for moral revival. I want to welcome you to this press briefing uh, about our campaign. We want to today use this time, we want to use this time to release the souls of poor folks out in America. It's a, it's a hefty document that looks at what's happened in this country over the last 50 years as it relates to the evils that Dr. King raised, and it includes uh, ecolo ecological devastation and degradation. We cannot have this kind of report without including that. We're also this morning going to raise up the demands from this campaign. This campaign has gone all over this country he doing hearings and talking to folks and doing uh, data checks and looking around us. And based on that, we've come up with demands that have to be made. This is the time, this is the right time to do this audit. This is the right time to raise these demands. We're also going to give details about the 40 days of action that go with this campaign and people will be able to get a full picture of what is going to happen and why we're doing what we're doing at this time to lift up the evils, to lift up the work, to build power in the states for folks who are active, for folks who are impacted, for folks who want to change the country. This morning we are joined by folks who have been working on this campaign, first of all by people who are, who are impacted who are impacted by racism, who are impacted by militarism, who are impacted by all the evils that Dr. King raised up and the evils that we've been working and fighting so hard against in the state. So we've, we're, they are here with us today. We're joined by faith leaders and clergy from all over the country. We're, we're joined by organizations, both faith and, and secular organizations, social justice organizations that have endorsed this campaign. Nearly a hundred organizations have stepped forward to be a part of this campaign and the number is growing. We're also joined by, um, by folks who are representing uh, unions, labor unions, people who understand that poverty and good jobs go hand in hand. They, you, have, you can't have one, you, can't, you have to have a good job to get rid of poverty. So that's who is here today, and we welcome all of you, people who support this work, people who want to make a difference, um, to make a difference in this country. We want to start this briefing with a brief look at what this campaign is. So there's a video, if we could start with that. So this feels like the old mass meeting. We're here in all of our diversity. We're here in the human family. There is a fire raging now for the poor of this society. They are living in tragic conditions because of the terrible economic injustices that keep them locked in. We have to deal with our war economy and systemic racism and systemic poverty and ecological devastation. And finally, we have to deal with the moral narrative. This wall, this is sin of the highest order. We are traveling around this country building this Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. What we want to do now is hear a little bit from the local community who are a part of this campaign. I've spent five years, five or so more years ho homeless. Living on minimum wage has caused me to have to figure out on a daily basis how to afford basic necessities. While the U.S. sends trillions abroad, my friends, family, and fellow veterans suffer the economic consequences of the war economy. I have two children and I enjoy raising them while acknowledging that being poor is a struggle of human rights. But when I lost my housing, healthcare and income all at the same time. I was terrified, panicked. I want to stand here and reclaim the power and dignity of the mujeres in my life. I can't afford to pay a cab. It was one thing to know that you didn't have water and you couldn't afford your water. It's a whole nother to find out that they shut off your entire community and none of you matter. And in the aftermath of climate change disasters, 
poor people are, and people of color are the ones to lose their homes. Who can survive with 725? No parents should have, in America should have to bury their pet, their children for a lack of medical education. Being poor is not a sin. Poverty is a sin. Being homeless is not a sin. Homelessness is a sin. And we are here and it's time for us to be the remnant that can transform the nation. We are calling for a season of moral resistance. A season of organizing, a season of massive, nonviolent, moral, direct action. There will be a movement that will break through the con and cut through the lies and bring people together to save the heart and the soul of this democracy and this world. So that's a snapshot of what's been happening around this country over the past almost year of getting ready for the 40 days. I'd like to now introduce the co-chairs of this campaign, Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris and Reverend Dr. William Barber II. Good morning. Good morning. And I first want to just have all of the organizers and staff team who have been moving all across the country uh, from the Center for Popular Education, from Kairos, and from Repairs just raise their hand. Would you all, to, I want you all to give these folk a big hand. Betty, everybody. To, and all of the steering committee members who are here, would you just raise your hand? And all of the people that are directly impacted by one of these issues, poverty, racism, voter suppression, ecological devastation, that's what we really is everybody. That's the point. That's the point. I do want to ask one thing this morning because some, in years ago in 68, but when, when Dr. King and others, um, and we always like to say others, we don't like to isolate it as Dr. King. In fact, we have one original member of the 25 people that were in the first meeting right here this morning who's on our steering committee. Al, would you stand up? He was in the meeting. He was an organizer and was, and so we have to be careful. It was a conglomeration of groups and people, National Welfare Rights Workers and Jewish Federation and folk from Eastern Kentucky and coal miners and others who had come together. But one thing had happened, a lot of the denominational leaders, religious leaders, had walked away from Dr. King, particularly when he talked about those three evils. I want to ask the denominational leaders who are here today to come up and come up right across the front. Where are they, the denominational leaders that are here today? Come on, because it's important. Not only are they coming just to pray, but they say they're engaging in direct action. From the Episcopal Church, from the... Christian Church Disciples of Christ and different groups, Presbyterian Church. If you all were just across there, yeah, National Council of Churches, our rabbis, these are all the first African-American woman of the Disciples of Christ denomination in the country. Just move over some just a little bit more. Just slide a little bit to the left. I want, we've got, uh, hey, brother, hey, hey, man, Jewish, hey, we got Iman, where's my brother Iman? Come on right over there, brother, with them. We've got Unitarians and Imams and rabbis and Christian pastors and, and even people of faith, not of faith. Just, just move over a little bit. I don't want to block this, this <laughs> sister who's going to testify. All right. Over the past two years, the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival, has carried out an organizing tour in dozens of states across the nation. We've met with tens of thousands of people from El Paso, Texas, to Marks, Mississippi, to South Charleston, West Virginia. We've gathered testimony from hundreds of poor people and listened to their demands for a better society. This morning as I stand here, I'm reminded first of the scripture that says in Isaiah 10, 
Woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights and make women and children their prey. And then I'm thinking specifically about the four white women from West Virginia that came out of the mountains that shared their story just a few weeks ago in Charleston. And I'm looking at my brother Chase from Eastern Kentucky who told me the story of homeless young people in Eastern Kentucky and how nobody ever comes to really see them and care about them. Chase, just raise your hand this morning. The moral agenda, <clears throat> the moral agenda we are announcing today is drawn from this listening and organizing tour and an audit of America, the idea of which first came from the Reverend Dr. James Forbes, Jim Forbes, is being conducted with allied organizations, including the Institute for Policy Studies and the Urban Institute, 50 years after the original Poor People's Campaign. So the goal is to not only have the faces, but also the facts and the footnotes. Our Poor People's Campaign moral agenda demands a massive overhaul of the nation's voting rights laws new programs to lift up the 140 million poor and working poor Americans, and the immediate attention to ecological devastation and measures to curb militarism and the war economy. It calls for major changes to address systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, the war economy, and our distorted moral narrative, where too often the moral conversation in the public square is limited by the so-called Christian nationalism or religious nationalism to things like prayer in the school and uh, being against abortion, against gay people, and for gun rights, for tax uh, cuts for the wealthy. We know that our deepest moral traditions are much broader than that. We are calling for a repeal of the 2017 federal tax law, implementation of a federal and state living wages, universal single payer health care, and, and clean water for all. And we, you can read about the demands at poorpeoplecampaign.org or text MORAL to 90975. And we are not isolating these issues. This is fusion organizing. We understand you can't address one without the other. And we didn't get these from any party, left or right, or any candidates. They come out of our deepest moral traditions, religious traditions, constitutional traditions, and from the people. The demands will guide 40 days of nonviolent moral fusion direct action that we're organizing in as many as 30, nearly 40 states over a six week period from Mother's Day to June 23rd. People of all races, colors, creeds, sexualities are joining to engage in, a, in nonviolent moral direct action, massive voter mobilization and power building from the bottom up, all three. We will no longer allow attention violence to keep the poor people of color and other disenfranchised people down. We went through, and listen at this, a presidential election cycle, 26 debates on the Democrat and Republican side, primary and general, and there was not one hour on poverty. Not one hour on restoring the Voting Rights Act, even though here we are today, 50 years after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, actually 52, and we have fewer voting rights today than we had in 1965. Every decision is a moral decision, especially when it deals with poor people, children, and health care, and we must have moral dissent and moral vision and people who will challenge the status quo. Let me turn over to Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, as you all know, we stand together, we are being unified together, and we never stand at a podium by ourselves, because this is not helicopter leadership, this is about the people coming together. Amen. So I want to start with a, a story from the organizing tour that we have been on for the last couple of months, um, where poor folks that are organizing across all the lines that divide us um, are coming together and calling for this campaign. At the 53rd anniversary of the Selma Jubilee, the Bloody Sunday and the Selma to Montgomery March, we visited Lowndes County, Alabama. Lowndes County, Alabama is right on the road between Selma and Montgomery. It's where the Black Panther Party was born. It's where the Snick House is still located. And today, in 2018, 
35% of people living in Lowndes County have parasites, have hookworm, because there are no sanitation services. And this is impacting poor black people and poor white people. And folks are, are coming forward saying, time is now for a moral revival in this land. Yeah, 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 we yeah, need yeah, 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 yeah. a poor people's campaign. So 50 years after leaders of the 1968 poor people's campaign declared silence was betrayal, we are coming together to break the silence and tell the truth about interlocking evils of systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation, the war economy, and our distorted moral narrative. To prepare for the 40 days that Reverend Barber was just talking about, that start on Mother's Day, May 13th, and culminate on June 21st, the anniversary of the deaths of Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman, to prepare for these 40 days, poor and disenfranchised people, clergy and advocates, will participate in nonviolent direct action trainings. And those are happening this coming Saturday in 40 states across the country. The people are getting organized. Our 40 days of nonviolent moral fusion, direct action, will launch here in Washington, D.C. with this mass meeting that we'll have on the evening of Mother's Day. The first week of the actions will center around child poverty, women in poverty, and the impact of poverty on people with disabilities. Subsequent weeks will focus on systemic racism, veterans and their war economy and militarism, ecological devastation, inequality, and the distorted moral narrative that reigns supreme in our nation today. Poor people, clergy, activists, people of goodwill, advocates, organizing in states will wind up here in Washington, D.C. with a mass mobilization at the U.S. Capitol on June 23rd. And that mass mobilization will just be the beginning of what will be a multi-year state-based effort to transform our nation's economic, political, and moral structures to save this nation's soul. Those of us who have been organizing the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival in states across the country for years, are beginning to attract growing support for our work from different national organizations. And so today, at this press briefing, we are proud to announce that more than 100 national organizations have signed on to support the powerful, grassroots, state-based organizing that is building this movement. We want to note today that there is no way that we can save the heart and soul of this democracy. We're not talking about the heart and soul of a party, any party, but the heart and soul of this democracy. We're not doing this merely because it's the 50th year. This is not another commemoration. It's not another remembrance. This is a, this is a necessary moment of resurrection and re-engagement. Uh, to save the heart and soul of this nation. And it cannot happen unless we have a deeply moral, deeply constitutional, anti-racist, anti-poverty, pro-justice, pro-labor, fusion type of organizing that builds for years, not just for one event. I want to say that most important, you heard something, and I want you to hear it at this conference that Liz just said. She said the national organizations are joining the organizing in the states. Sometimes we have organized it. We have national organizing, and we say, well, that's the thing. We believe that the true organizing that must take place in this country for transformation is from the bottom up. And it must be led by impacted people, not for them. With them, not for them. 
And so that is why people are joining because there are 40 organizing committees in these 40 states that each have a tri-chair, which is an impacted person, a clergy, an advocate, and they are coming together and organizing from the bottom up. And it represents every race, color, creed, and sexuality across this land. That's what must happen. We know, we love D.C., we love New York, but movements don't start from D.C. down. They start from Montgomery and Selma and Greensboro and other places up. Right. Right. And, and our focus, really clear, is on the Congress and state capitals. We're not doing this just because Trump got elected. Because even if he hadn't have gotten elected, 37 million people would still be without health care. Now, there are certain things he's exacerbating. But we're focused on our attention on the Congress and the state legislatures where laws can be put in place that will last and have 20 to 30 years of impact. We're also not just organizing for D.C. These will be simultaneous actions in every state around the country, something historians tell us have never happened, but it's time for it to happen. Amen. I want to ask all of our national uh, the, the organizations that have, that have seen ordinary people organizing and said, look, I, we want to be a part of that. That, that, because we see the people rising. Where are they at? National, we've got Mary Kay with SEIU. Who, are the, who else is here? National LGBTQ. United States Labor you, you say it again? United States Commercial Union. All right. Who else? Labor Labor for Physicians, for Physicians for National Health Program. Yeah. American, Friends American Friends Service. United Steelworkers. United Steelworkers. <laughs> Doctors for America. Doctors for AFT. America. AFT. Ask me. Where's Lee? Where's Dr. Right but, hey, Doc, you need a chair? Up. You all right? <laughs> all right. He's been marching and carrying on in, in Memphis. But this is the point. And all of these leaders have said, we will join hands with the poor. We will engage in direct action with the poor. And even the clergy that are here, let me see if I put them on the spot a little bit. The clergy have been telling me they didn't come to just pray this time. That's right. They come to stand with the poor. And if you take them in, the poor in the jail, you're going to have to take these people, with these religious leaders with them too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what we're talking about. So three things, direct action, moral, nonviolent, fusion direct action, massive voter mobilization, and power building from the bottom up. Let me ask now my dear sister Claudia if she would come, who is a tremendous sister working with popular education, to talk for a few minutes about organizing hope. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So my name is Claudia de la Cruz. I have two minutes to say a lot of things, so I'll just share that. I am not speaking about the poor. I'm not speaking for the poor. I am the poor. Yes. I was born in the poorest congressional district in the United States of America, the South Bronx. Mm -hmm. A forgotten borough, a neglected community mm -hmm. filled with poor people, hardworking people that have been told that our condition is our fault. Yeah. I am proudly a member of the National Steering Committee of the Poor People's Campaign mm -hmm. and one of the state organizers for the New York City area. We believe and are committed that what we are doing is organizing the hope of the poor. The hope that is often used and abused by politicians, whether they are Republicans or Democrats. The hope of a dignified life our very right to exist. Mm -hmm. We are saying that we are here and we're ready to take over right. because we may not run the United States, but we make it run. And we are ready to shut it down with our bodies right. for the simple fact that our bodies are on the line every day. Every day by policies that are created to kill us, mm -hmm. by cops that are placed in our neighborhoods to police and criminalize us, right. by health care systems that are made business. Mm -hmm. So no, this is not a campaign for and about the poor. Mm -hmm. 
we are showing that we have the ability to organize our dreams, our hopes, our aspirations that are not necessarily aspirations of wealth as much as they are aspirations of living, yeah. not merely surviving. I am one of 140 million people who are living in the United States in poverty, in a country that is filled with wealth, that has an abundant amount of resources, that is immoral and shameful. And we are the ones to call this nation not only you know, to transform the soul, right. but to its consciousness. Yes. We're not only mobilizing bodies, we're here to transform lives. Mm -hmm. yes. And we're here to eradicate systems that have for too long existed and killed us. Right. I have a three-year-old son, I'm the second, I'm the daughter of second generation immigrants from the Dominican Republic. I owe it to them and I owe it to those to come. Everyone in this room does. And so a poor people's campaign is not a 40-day action. It's a multi-year project. And it is spiritual as it is political. And we must take it on. Thank yes, you. Yes, yes. A poor people's campaign. Poor people's campaign. A national call. A national call for more revival. For more revival. Reverend Dr. Forbes um, uh, is a tremendous gift and to this nation as well. And some years ago, he said we ought to put an audit before the country. And then he wanted to raise today about why decent people. I want him to articulate it his own way, and why this is so important to do just what you said, Claudia, to strike at the consciousness and the soul of the country. Dr. Ford, would you all welcome him? Brothers and sisters, the great, kind, all-seeing, and all-knowing spirit of the universe, the spirit of truth, justice, peace, and love, cares enough about creation to keep account of the dimensions, the rates, the ratios, the accretions, and the diminishment of all things living, dying, and dead. In regards to precious human beings, there is a ledger recording the hairs of our heads, the tears we shed, our heartbeats and our heartaches, our hopes and our dreams. Yeah. In the hustle and bustle of thoughtless living, we forget to count our blessings or to enumerate the transgressions for which we are held accountable eternally. Personal amnesia about these matters is compounded in condemnatory culpability by nations that seek to expunge the records of their dastardly deeds that are done so that they can claim a profile of virtue not predicated by accumulated data of the brutal inhumanity to countless sisters and brothers not count it worthy of respect, rights, protections, or care. From time to time, the great spirit, in order to alert us to the perils of the pa on the path we are heedlessly traveling, calls us, all of us, to pause for a moment to do an audit of our affairs, an assessment of our decency deficit and accounting of fraudulent cover-ups of discrepancies between policies pronounced and the treatment of the vulnerable souls we dispense like excrement on the blood-stained soil of the greed, indifference, and the special prerogatives of the few. This is the prophetic moment. 
for the release to our nation of a souls of poor folks audit. I would like to audit, I'd like to amend this to talk about the souls of precious That's right, folks. poor folks. Fifty years ago, there were major differences in the death lists on earth and the cosmic accounting office. In, a different, in, a dis, in addition to the martyrdom of Martin Luther King Jr., uh, our, our sanitation workers, uh, Bobby Kennedy, there were tens of thousands of persons slain by poverty. Poverty, that largely invisible weapon of mass destruction. And the wars around the world. Anyway, these casualties continue to amount. We don't take account, but the Cosmic Accounting Office keeps track of it. It is amazing how different the accountings are. So, this year, this year, to honor the precious souls of the unknown and unnamed departed, God kicks off a century of jubilee justice and ordains and declares that all souls are mine. They all count and they must count. That is why we have the audit. Finally, when heaven weeps and our hearts are not touched, according to Reverend Barber, Dr. Barber, that is an indication of a societal cardiac crisis. Yeah. I think that's what you said, Doc. Such a serious problem demands urgent diagnosis, emergency treatment, and those of us who are here who love our nation sound the alarm. Summon the aids of all colleagues we can find on, on the earth and the aid of the Great Spirit to help us heed the warning, take remedial action, and prepare to find the path that leads to liberty and justice, health, and happiness for us all. Amen. 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 So now as we move to the presentation of the audit, and I'm going to ask the Reverend ha Theo Harris in a moment to introduce Shally and the other two persons who helped work with this, and then Shally will come up and bring IPS and the Urban Institute. I want to say, as Dr. Forbes has just noted, <clears throat> that we are in a time where we cannot allow people to pray P-R-A-Y for presidents and politicians mm -hmm. while they are praying P-R-A-E-Y-I-N-G on the poorest yeah. and the most vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah. That is uh, irreverent. Yeah. Um, and that is, that is, it would be immoral on our behalf. We would be the chaplains of injustice mm -hmm. rather than the critics of injustice. Yeah. And um, we all must see ourselves as a part of these moral defibrillators. Something's wrong when a study can come out and say a quarter million people are dying from poverty every year. And, 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 but they're dying in secret and in silence. And there's no moral outcry. That every night you can look at the TV and you can hear everything on any news station except the issues of poverty. You talk about Russia, we don't talk about how our system has been hijacked by racist voter suppression and gerrymandering. And so the first goal, and I want the media to be clear on this that are here, of this campaign is to shift the narrative. But in order to shift the narrative, you got to change the narrator. And that's why the goal is, is to get impacted people up and speaking and put a face up with the facts. Yeah. Somebody say a face, face. With, the with the facts. And we have to footnote our legitimate frustrations so that we're not just loud, but loud and right. 
Because until we shift the narrative, mm -hmm. you can't change the agenda. And right now, there's, the, the narrative is ignored. There's a kind of attention violence to these issues that then produces real physical and spiritual violence. And so now we are going to get into the point of the documents that, that footnote our legitimate frustration. Let me ask all of the D.C. organizing, Graylin, all the folk from D.C. that are organizing, right, raise your hand. D.C. organizing, Brother Graylin and all. That's a, give them a hand because they are so critical. And uh, say this, simultaneous. simultaneous. Say fusion. fusion. We're trying to get people to understand that if you're concerned about voting rights, you better be concerned about poverty. If you're concerned about poverty, you better be concerned about voting rights. If the same people are fighting us in our silos, if they are sinister enough to come together, we ought to be smart enough to come together. That's the point. That's the, and maybe in the process, win some of them. Because we don't believe if America really knows the truth, truth, that there's not a decent core of people out there that will be moved into action. So, Liz, would you introduce Shally, and then she'll bring on. And if anybody needs to step out or st lean against the wall, because we don't want anybody falling now, mm -hmm. we need you to hang around. And Liz and I are going to take a seat, too, huh? right That's here. Right. Okay. All right. If you need to take a seat, go ahead. So we have, um, we have, we want to bring up to the front um, three of the leaders that have been working on this audit. We uh, launched the audit about a year ago, and folk have been working for many, many months, um, you know, pulling together uh, the empirical um, data and analysis. And so, um, Shali Gupta Barnes um, is one of the three tri chairs of this audit for the campaign, and she has been working very closely um, with. Swarov um, Shakar and John Cavana, who um, are with the Institute for Pol Policy Studies. And so they'll, they'll come up, um, but we want to show some great appreciation for the really hard work that has gone into making sure that when we are loud, we are not wrong. Um, and that it's not that we pull together, you know, assortment of different issues that we think need to happen, but it's based on the lives um, the, the data um, of, of what's really taking place in this country. So, um, so we, we welcome you all and, and, and appreciate the work. Sean, do you all need the video at all? Screen? No, I okay. You all need to sit down? You good? You good? Liz, I got you in the stool. I'm going to sit down. Hello, everybody. It's been a real honor and responsibility to be working on this report with Reverend Forbes, Dr. Tyson, uh, who can be with us today, the Institute for Policy Studies, an incredible team of researchers and scholars, um, and uh, with the engagement of the Urban Institute and a whole host of political scientists, designers, um, uh, uh, impacted people, people who have been People who are at the forefront of struggles against systemic racism, poverty, the war economy and militarism, ecological devastation, um, and this distorted moral narrative to develop the souls of poor folk moral audit. Um, I wanted to say just for a second that I, um, I have three children, and I'm in this for them, and for all families and people with children and people who love children, yeah. and who understand that if a society that cannot take care of our children is not just approaching, it's approaching material death, right? Mm -hmm. And spiritual death. And we are fighting to keep the society alive. And that's why, that's why we are bringing people together. That's why we did this research. And that's why we are here today. Um, so when the Poor People's Campaign, as we saw in the video, um, started working on this report, we were coming out of a period of deep engagement with communities across the country. We had seen the conditions people were living in and, and coming up against every day. We had heard hundreds of testimonies. What we did not know was just how broad and deep the cracks and fissures in this country had become since the movements and the momentum of the 1960s. This report, as we will hear soon, is telling us that things have become worse. It's also showing us that what we've understood about these conditions has been wrong. It's been distorted to make us believe that this is how things have either always been or will be because we are flawed. Mm -hmm. 
and that it is way beyond our control to change things which cannot be changed. While we may be flawed, the Souls of Poor Folk audit is showing us that we are not the problem. This report is showing us that there has been a concentration of wealth and power over the past 50 years. At the same time, there's been an expansion of poverty and inequality. Our society is set up so only three people have the same wealth as 160 million people. This polarization has created the basis for attacks on voting rights, for attacks on democracy, for attacks on basic human needs like housing, health care, water, sanitation, education, jobs, and the right to organize for unions, uh, the expansion of polluting industries, and heightened impacts of climate change, and it's, it's paved the way, this polarization, for a heightened militarism and law and order response in our communities and devastating wars abroad. This report is showing us that these issues are interrelated. You cannot get rid of one without getting rid of the other. You cannot understand one without looking at all of the others. And that's because the lives of the poor in this country are in the center of all of them. What this report is telling us is that there is being a war waged on the poor in this country and around the world. And is in what we need to do is come together to fight poverty, not the poor. Yes. <clears throat> Here to tell us more about the findings are John Cavana, director of IPS, and Shorv Sharkar, my dedicated co-editor and coordinator of the Souls of Poor Folk Moral Audit. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shally. Thank you, Reverend Barber, Reverend Liz. Thank you most of all, Reverend Forbes, for pulling together all of our people for the last year late into the evening to work on this audit. Thank you for, for that inspiration. I'll speak for everyone at the Institute for Policy Studies when I relay to you how excited we were last summer when you asked us to step forward and take the lead on the audit. It's been a dream assignment for for researchers committed to public scholarship. Plus, 50 years ago, in 1968, IPS had been in the middle of research on the impacts of the Vietnam War and on the continuing scourge of racism four years after the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. We just put out the Vietnam Reader, which spelled out the ghastly costs of that war in Vietnam and here. And we helped author the call to resist illegitimate authority, which, like today, Ask people of conscience to consider acts of nonviolent direct action to oppose an immoral draft for an immoral war. So IPS left, leapt into this invitation to join you at looking back 50 years at Dr. King's, King's triplet of evils along with environmental destruction, and then walking forward 50 years and looking at the data, at the analysis, at all the expert witnesses you gathered, at the poor people you brought together to tell their stories. Much of what we found is organized in these 123 pages. And as you've heard, you can find this at the Poor People's Campaign website, at the IPS website. Use the hashtag Poor People's Campaign when you're sharing it. Please share it far and wide. What we found shocked even us. Mm. On the surface, it may have looked like it changed little over the past 50 years in the one figure that the official poverty rate was just over 12% of the population then, just as it is now. But as we dug behind those figures, our research has found a level of pain and suffering and systemic racism and immoral policies that should shock this nation into action. As you'll hear from my colleague Shorav Sharkar, behind those official 41 million living below the official poverty line, are tens of millions more who cannot live in dignity, not because of a lack of national resources, but because those resources are squandered on the largest war machine in history and on a tax scam that is taking resources from struggling city and state budgets and turning them over to military contractors. If you didn't think this was the moment for a massive national movement of moral action, then you need to read this report. 
Shorov is going to give you a few headlines on racism, systemic racism and poverty, and bring in a couple of people, and then I'll offer a few headlines on what we found on militarism and environmental destruction. Shorov Sharkar. Thanks, John. I'm Shorov Sharkar. I'm the research coordinator for the Poor People's Campaign at the Institute for Policy Studies. Um, I want to thank all the people who have been instrumental in the production of the report, including Shaley, my co-editor at the Cairo Center, Aaron Nafke, the assistant editor, Kenneth Worles, the designer of the report, um, the authors of the report, and the rest of the teams at IPS, Cairo Center, and Repairs of the Breach. Um, just as Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King saw the need to expand his work beyond the question of voting rights to issues related to the economy and militarism, the Souls of Poor Folk shows that the forces of racism, poverty, the war economy, and militarism, and ecological devastation are deeply linked. Here is just the tip of the iceberg on what we found on systemic racism and poverty. Systemic racism is evident in the wave of voting rights restrictions in more than 20 states since 2010. Since 1968, the number of disenfranchised voters has tripled to over 6 million Americans. In 2016, including one in 13 black adults. Systemic racism is unmistakable in the biased sentencing and policing practices that have expanded the share of federal and state prison inmates who are people of color from less than half in 1978 to 66% in 2016 and swelled the overall prison population to 1.6 million. And it is at plain as day in the dramatic increase in federal spending on anti-immigrant measures, including a tenfold increase in annual deportations from 1976 to 2015. We found similar results in education and housing. And so it didn't really matter what area you looked at, the signs of systemic racism were everywhere in our society. But the impact of this mass repression is not limited exclusively to communities of color. The politics of systemic racism is intertwined with the politics of repressing the poor. For example, we point out in the report that eight of the 10 poorest states that enacted voter suppression laws or only recently saw such laws overturned in court um, have also uh, opted not to accept expanded Medicaid benefits under the Affordable Care Act. Um, and I want to introduce Callie Greer from Selma, Alabama to tell her story um, about Medicaid expansion. And as Sal is coming, I think it's important for the media to hear and those of you to hear, she may be African American, but the majority of the people that were denied Medicaid expansion in Alabama are white. That's right. And that's one of the points we want to say to the media. When you, when you hear us talk about systemic racism and the connection to poverty, we're not just talking about black poverty. That's right. Because the majority of the people who are poor in this country are white women and working and children and disabled. That's right. But that has been lied. We've been lied to about that. And instead of black poor people and working poor people and black, white poor people and working poor people and brown coming together, they've been systematically divided. Yeah, thank you. And we have to bring that together and show the connection that the same states that in massive voter suppression are also the poorest states, yeah. also the states without living wages, states without health care, that hurt all people. So isn't that a trick? You use racism to get elected. Yes. Right. But then once you get elected, you pass policies that hurt everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so she's representing herself with hundreds of thousands of people in Alabama. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Blessings, uh, blessings from Selma, Alabama. Um, first, if I may, I'd like to make a quick disclaimer. A gentleman did a, a story on me, uh, did a picture on me, and Reverend Tracy Blackman told my story for me. She promised she'd never forget and would always speak Venice's name. And I thank her for that. Amen. In this story, she put a number on the visits to uh, uh, the emergency room that Venus, I don't know the number. I wasn't journaling that. We were taking care of our baby. Um, and she stated that Venus had a double mis uh, uh, mastectomy. Double. Thank you, sir. <laughs> she had um, one and a uh, radical mastectomy. So, yes, and um, so in, 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 in keeping this truth uh, true and not allowing the enemy any room That's to come right. in and, 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 and take the truth 
and the devastation loss of, for Venus from us, I wanted to say that. Mm -hmm. and, and again, thank Will P for this story, this beautiful story that he did on Venus. And thank Reverend Tracy Blackman for her faithfulness and love and support of us. On my journey, and our journey is moving, I want to be clear and as correct as possible. And in doing so, I stand here before you again today and say that we are in a fight for our lives. This human rights movement, we are fighting for our lives, the lives of those that we love and care for. This Poor People campaign is a call for national moral revival. As I stand before you today giving my true and heartbroken testimony, my four-month-old great-granddaughter, Michaela, who was hospitalized for a week when she was only two months old, has, because she has a serious skin problem, has yet to be given a Medicaid card or a number. She is now four years old. She has yet to have a six-week checkup in the state of Alabama. And we still don't know the name of the sickness that she had. Even though that my, great, great, my granddaughters did several applications for a Medicaid card. So while I embrace all your support, love, and remembering Venus and our son Mercury, because we've lost two children, and we will continue to do so, there is an urgent need to focus on even more the living now. We are still suffering, mother, suffering the mothers, fathers, daughters, sons, grands, and great-grands that we will lose. if we don't stand up and fight. Yeah. I will not be quiet. Yeah. I'm the town crier. Yeah. I will cry out loud in every store, factory, shop, and mall, in every public, political, and all other arenas. Yes, while our loved ones yes suffer in heartless, power-hungry, cold, and cruel, unjust society, I will cry out loud and spare not against these atrocities. But more than that, I will march, protest, and hold back my monies not supporting this corrupt system. I will plant my seeds in good ground. I will vote. I said I will vote. And when I do, I will remember those that fought and died so that I can. That's right. I will not waste my pain. Mm -hmm. So I charge you to march, vote, plant your seeds in good ground so that this good work can reap a good harvest. Vote. And when you do, remember Venus, Mercury, and Michaela. Remember all those we have lost needlessly. Remember all we are losing even now. As I stand before you testifying, remember, vote. Vote for life. Vote for justice. Vote for love. Vote for you. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And um, we want to bring up Reverend Sarah Monroe now to speak about the criminalization of poverty. Two thousand years ago, Jesus stood in Nazareth in a little tiny town on the edge of empire, and he said that the spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he was going to proclaim liberty to the prisoners. Where I come from, in Aberdeen, Washington, a little tiny town on the coast, 46% of our population is on public assistance. One in 16 of our people are homeless. And to be poor in America today is very often to be heavily criminalized as well, especially if you're young. And that might be, you, you might be criminalized for sleeping on a park bench or pitching a tent in the wrong place or you might be criminalized for all of the things that poor people are forced to do in order to survive, all of the things that, all of the um, things that poor people do when there's no jobs and no access to legal employment 
um, people forced to work in the black market and people forced to work um, in illegal trades in order to survive. All of these things criminalize our young people over and over again. And in my community and in communities across the country, they face excessive police violence. They're caged at a higher rate than anywhere else in the world. And what I see is a systemic loss of hope and dignity. As they're told over and over again, sometimes from the time that they're very, very young, that they are worth anything and that their lives don't matter. Criminalization in the United States disproportionately impacts black and brown communities. But in my community where we are a majority white, it very heavily impacts us as well, oh, yeah. Yeah. especially our young people. And when I think about this and I put a face on this, I think of Zach. Zach was a young man um, that, I, that was, I pastored and walked with through, through jail multiple times. Zach was homeless at 13. He was in and out of the juvenile justice system um, from that time until he was 18. I'm, I come from a county that actually has the highest incarceration rate for juvenile offenders for non-criminal offenses in the entire country. And so he went through all of that and by the time he was 18, he was sent to the highest security prison in the state for stealing about $100 worth of stuff in his quest for survival. That's an all black community, right? <laughs> it's an all, almost all white community, 75%. Attack the poor. That's right. That's right. That's right. For the rest of his life, after he got out of prison, he was on probation. And because he couldn't meet the terms of probation most of the time due to homelessness and addiction, he was in and out of prison and in and out of jail. And that's where I walked with him. Um, the most and watched him over and over be victim of, of police violence and, and of the jail system. Zach died a year ago. He died of pneumonia at 24 in the richest country in the world. So for my people, for Zach, and for the several million people incarcerated in the United States, we demand what Jesus said 2,000 years ago. We demand liberty for the prisoners. Now, um, I just want to turn it back over to John Cavana, who's going to talk to you about the militarism and war economy and ecological devastation sections in our report. Yeah, let me just finish that powerful testimony with, with a couple of points on each. First, on militarism and the war economy, and keep in mind Reverend Barber's telling us to remember fusion, how these are related. Since the height of the Vietnam War, the gap between our military and anti-poverty spending has grown even more out of any sensible proportion. Back then, federal spending on the military amounted to twice the level of discretionary spending to fight poverty. Today, this spending gap is nearly four to one. In the meantime, millions have, of lives have been lost in wars that have made us no safer, while real security in the form of good jobs, health care, and quality education remains beyond the reach of millions. Did you know that out of every dollar in federal discretionary spending, 53 cents now goes to the military? Well, just 15 cents goes to anti-poverty programs. Trump wants to make that gap even bigger. Under his budget proposal, 65 cents of every discretionary dollar would go to the military, and just 12 cents would go to anti-poverty programs. Where does this money go? Hundreds of billions to military contractors. Did you know that in 2017, the CEOs of the top five military contractors earned on average $19 million, which is 640 times more than the 30,000 earned by army privates in combat? Did you know also that nearly half of female military personnel sent to Iraq and Afghanistan have reported being sexually harassed? Nearly a quarter said they had been sexually assaulted. And finally, a couple words on the environment. In this report, we dive deep into how the U.S. has the biggest, has become the biggest driver of climate change impacts 
in this country which disproportionately hit the poor and people of color. But as we dive really deep uh, in this report into a problem that I think most middle class and wealthy Americans barely know exists, there's a huge part of this on the crisis of water. Liz started with this and I'll end with it. Did you know that at least four million families with children are being exposed to high levels of lead from drinking water and other sources? The risks fall especially heavily on low-income African-American and Latinx children, in part because they're the most likely to live in aging, poorly maintained housing. Did you know this? There are 13.8 million low-income households that cannot afford water. We end this by saying none of this is inevitable. The rules, the laws, the institutions, the budgets, are the creation of people, and they can be changed by people, from state capitals to Washington, and they will be. So we turn, in conclusion, back again to where we started to Reverend Liz and Reverend Barber to offer us a fusion moral agenda to do just this. <laughs> Let's thank the, our researchers. Any prophetic and moral movement Any prophetic and moral movement must have its facts straight, must tell the truth if we're going to be set free, must tell the truth, and must help us not just fight in our silos, but understand that interlocking injustices demand an intersectional, interrelational prophetic moral movement. You, you have to come together. We have to operate together and not allow people to pick us off. For instance, in West Virginia last week, uh, the governor did a tricky thing with the teachers. They gave the teachers a raise, but then cut Medicaid. We have to see that and resist that and fight against that. We also, the fifth evil is this distorted moral agenda where we have clergy giving cover for those who, who pass these policies. And I don't say anything but what Ezekiel said. He said, your politicians have, have, have hurt the poor and the immigrant and the stranger, but there's something worse. Your preachers cover up for them. And we are saying as members of the clergy, we can no longer allow our moral narrative in this country, whether it be a religious moral narrative or a constitutional moral narrative, to be limited to personal piety and we do not say anything about the evil and idolatry of public policy that are hurting people and destroying their lives every day. And so we have somewhat of a time restraint, I understand, from, from the um, a couple of minutes. I do want to do two things. Liz and I are going to go right into a set of demands. She's going to do the ones under democracy. I'm going to do the ones under poverty. And the being media, we're doing this because the expectation would be if I'm African American, I do voting, and if she's white. And we're saying we got to mess that whole way of thinking up because it's about fusion. It's about fusion. And then I want to ask Mary Kay to just say a quick word at the closing. And we have media availability afterwards, even if we're out of this room. Real quick. All right. We're going to wrap. All right. All right. So, um, in terms of uh, democracy and systemic racism and voting rights, the truth is that uh, when democratic process and the right to vote are restricted, preempted, and nullified, our democracy is under attack. These attacks target people of color, especially the poor, youth, and elderly. But in doing so, they strip us all of our constitutional protections. They allow extremists to get elected through voter suppression and racial gerrymandering and then use their power to hurt people of all races. So we have the right to vote and the right to accountable political representation. Therefore, we demand the immediate full restoration and expansion of the Voting Rights Act, an end to racist gerrymandering and restricting, the implementation of automatic registration at the vote, to vote at the age of 18, early voting in every state, same-day registration, the enactment of Election Day as a holiday, and a verifiable paper record. Yeah. And we demand the right 
to vote for the formerly incarcerated. We also demand the reversal of state laws preempting local governments from passing minimum wage increases the removal of emergency financial management positions that are unaccountable to democratic processes, and we demand statehood for Washington, D.C. And we demand that in that area that we have a just policy for immigrants and immigration because we know that the real fight is over democracy and changing the political landscape. And as much money as they have made for this country, they ought to have a clear route to citizenship so that they can vote and participate in this democracy. Now, I'm not going to read all of these because of the time. I do want to say because there are over 250,000 people dying every year because of low wealth. And for every one million people without health care, over 5,600 die. And because there are not 40 million poor people, but over 140 million people that are poor or working poor, and 43% of this population today, we demand federal and state living wage laws, guaranteed annual incomes for the poor, full employment, and the right for all workers to form and join unions. And we also demand fully funded welfare programs for the poor. We demand equal pay for equal work. We demand equity in education, ensuring that every child receives a high quality, well-funded, diverse public education. We demand free tuition for, at public colleges and universities and an end to the proliferation of student debt. We demand equitable funding for HBCUs. And we did not get these from Bernie or anybody else. We got them from Jesus and our deepest moral values. We demand the expansion of Medicaid in every state and the protection of Medicare until the full implementation of single-payer universal health care for all. We demand reinvestment in and expansion of public housing, ensuring that they ha all have decent housing to live in. We demand equal treatment and accessible housing, health care, and mobility, adequate income and services for people with disabilities. We demand public infrastructure projects and sustainable community based and control economic uh, initiatives that target the poor and rural communities. We demand relief from the crushing household student and consumer death. We, de we demand that the wealthy and corporations pay their fair share of our country's urgent needs around decent and affordable housing, free public education, and a robust social safety net and social security. And we demand the repeal of the 2017 federal tax law and the reinvestment of these funds into social programming that helps all and not just the wealthy and the greedy. These are just a portion of our demands. The rest of them are online. We are going to push this out. And on, on May 13th, Mother's Day, and on the 14th, of Monday after Mother's Day, we will begin a 40-day season to launch the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for my revival. Mary Kay, Mary Kay has been such a friend. I know we got to go, but we're going to go with her saying the last word. She's been such a friend with all of our union brothers. Thank you so much, uh, the two million members of SEIU, the millions more in the American labor movement that you heard shouted out earlier, are proud to stand with the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival. Because we know that no one organization, no one faith denomination, no one group of the impacted can accomplish these demands by ourselves. And that we, the time is now, sisters and brothers, the time is now to accomplish these demands together and build the powerful, spirit-filled force that we need to win justice once and for all to our nation. I am proud to stand with all of the people here to make that possible. Thank you. Thank you to everybody for this briefing. The media that are here, we are available for access to the media, those who spoke, IPS, Urban, Liz, myself. Everybody, say everybody. Everybody. Has, has a, right a right to live. To live. And that's why, and that's why this campaign We'll be birth. We'll, be birth. we'll, live. we'll live. We'll change the narrative. We'll change the narrative. And we'll transform the soul of this country. We'll